Hey, good evening, everyone. Thanks for uh, thanks for coming, and thanks especially for inviting me to to be with you. You know, I the first time I went to India, I've been to as uh, as uh, as has been said, I I've been to uh, many countries in the world, and uh, a few years ago I went to India for the first time, and I I just didn't know what to expect. But can I tell you that? that in all honesty, that India is part of the most fascinating country I've ever been to. Um, I, don't, I'm not even, I don't even know quite how to describe my experience, but I, I, uh, it's very interesting to me uh, to feel the burden uh, for your country, for the country of India. And uh, I, do, I do feel that burden, and I'm really looking forward to, to being there again uh, in November. I just feel like, you know, I, I don't think I've ever seen so many people in my life. I mean, I've been to China. Uh, but when I was in India, what, what hit me was just how big, just how big that country is. I live, in a, I live in a large country geographically. We have a lot of land. We just don't have any people. Uh, but in India, it just hit me just how complex and how complicated India really is. I don't even pretend to understand it. But you know what? I don't have to. I just have to go and preach the gospel. Amen? And uh, so I'm looking forward to doing that. But tonight, I, I want to share something with you tonight, and hopefully uh, something that's really close to my own heart. And I, first of all, I want to tell you a couple of stories. Um, these are true stories. There was uh, a few years ago, there was a man named Sid and his wife, Christy. And uh, Sid was working on his wife's car. And he had the car jacked up, and he was underneath the car, and he was working, he was working on the brakes. And his wife was in the house, and all of a sudden she heard a large crash because the jack had slipped out from under the car, and the car had come down upon her husband. And, uh, and, j and so by the, because of the weight of the car on his chest, he couldn't speak. Uh, he couldn't even yell out. And, uh, but he, could, he kicked over his toolbox with his foot. And she was in the kitchen, and she heard the toolbox upside, go upside down. She rushed out into the garage. She saw her husband trapped under the car, and he was suffocating because the weight of the car was on his chest, and he couldn't breathe. So she, she, she ran into the house, and she called 911 and said, Come quickly, my, my husband's trapped under the car. Then she ran across the street uh, to get help from her neighbors uh, because she didn't know what else to do. She came back. By the time the emergency people had got there, her husband was dead. He had died of it. He had been asphyxiated. He couldn't breathe. Six months later, in another situation, a similar event happened to another couple. And he too was working on his truck, and he was trying to fix the exhaust system on his truck, and again the jack slipped out from underneath the truck, the truck came down on him, and he had just enough time to yell help before the weight of the truck came on him and he was not being able to breathe. His wife again heard the noise, rushed out into the garage, but this, but but she handled it differently than the first woman. She didn't go in the house and call 911. She didn't run across the street to get help from her neighbors. Instead, she grabbed the bumper of the car and lifted up the truck high enough for her husband to roll out from underneath the truck, and his life was saved. He had two broken ribs and a new respect for his wife of 25 years. <clears throat> now, what's See, so why did you tell me these two stories? I told you these two stories to say this one thing. The power to save was available in both situations, but it was only summoned in the second. In other words, how did that woman lift that truck? It's called adrenaline. There was such a... She just, when she came out into the garage, she saw her husband under the truck. She didn't even think about what to do. She just knew my husband is getting out from underneath that truck. And before she even thought about it, she grabbed the bumper of the truck and lifted up the truck. Because, but the, but the, the, power, the power was available in both situations, but only summoned in the second. This is another true story. There was a man in our country, his name was Danny Simpson. And this is a true story that happened a few years ago, and it happened in our capital city, Ottawa. And Danny Simpson... Um, decided one day to rob a bank. And so he had a gun uh, that had been in his family for years. And so he took this handgun and he went and he robbed a bank of $6,000. Well, eventually the police caught up to Danny and Danny spent, was sent to prison and his gun was sent to the museum. Because in fact the gun had been made in 1918 
was an antique and was worth $100,000. <laughs> he used a gun worth $100,000 to rob a bank of six because he didn't realize what he had in his hand. He had a lot more in his hand than he ever realized. What I want to talk to you about this, this evening is the power of the Holy Spirit. Because you have access to power and to resources that many times we do not understand and we forget about. I have been a, a Christian many years. I've been in ministry for almost 40 years. And I have seen so many situations where Christians forget that they have access to the most powerful person in the universe, the Holy Spirit. They have access to the Holy Spirit. And we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And yet many, many Christians live in defeat and, 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 are, and, and suffer loss when in fact they could live differently. You know, um, Paul said this. You know, when I, when I read, the, when I read uh, his epistles, when I read the book of Acts, I find that there's a real emphasis in the Bible, in the New Testament, about us, you and I, being filled with the Holy Spirit and moving, not just in theology, you can have all the best theology in the world and not be experiencing the power of God. Paul was not interested in just teaching his people th good theology. He wanted them to experience God, experience the power of God. He said this in first, to the church at Corinth. He said in 1 Corinthians 4 verse 20, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. It's not about talking. You know, one of the problems we have in churches is we do a lot of talking. Amen? We can listen to, you can, you can spend your life listening to 5,000 sermons and then go to heaven. And we just talk about it. You can end up talking about this message. I hope that this isn't just a message that you talk about. I want you just, not, I don't want you just to hear my words. I want you to experience the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul wanted. And so he said in, in, in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, Jesus said to his disciples, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. We have the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I don't want you going anywhere. I don't want you leaving Jerusalem. I, want, I don't want you to try and do any ministry on your own strength or your own experience. I want you to be empowered with the Holy Spirit. And in that power... I want you to go and be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the outermost parts of the world. Amen. Amen? In the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, I, uh, one time, you know, I, I prayed this prayer a number of times. You know, before I, when I come into a church service like this, one, several years ago, I was, I was, I was in a, going to be going in to preach. And I, I started thinking about Elijah on Mount Carmel when he called fire down from heaven. So I started praying and said, Lord, would you, let, would you send the fire? Lord, when I preach tonight, could you just send the fire, God? Could the fire fall in our congregation the same way it did on Mount Carmel for Elijah? And then I started thinking in Acts chapter 4 where the disciples had this great prayer meeting. And, uh, the, root, and the, the Bible says that the whole house shook and the power of the Holy Spirit fell upon the disciples, and they went out with great boldness and said, oh Lord, would you just shake the church tonight? Would you just shake the house? And, and the Holy Spirit showed up, and uh, he kind of rebuked me. He said, hey Dave, he said, you know what? Elijah was on Mount, he said, your situation is a little different tonight than it was for Elijah. Elijah was on Mount Carmel battling 450 prophets of Baal, and if he lost that battle, they were going to cut off his head. You're just going to be in a church meeting tonight. You don't need fire. Elijah was in, Elijah needed fire. What do you need fire for? And the disciples that were in the room with the house shook, they were being threatened with prison and even loss of their life for preaching the gospel. You're not experiencing any threat. Why do you need the house to shake? You know, the Holy Spirit is called the comforter. Amen? But why do we need a com why do we need comfort when we're so comfortable? Amen? So, oh God, send me the Holy Spirit. Lord, let me experience the comforter. Why? You're already too comfortable. Amen? Why do you need a comfort? Why do you need comfort? And so, can I say this to you, church? 
When you read the book, when you read the Bible, the Old Testament, and you read the New Testament, we see incredible displays of God's power. Amen? We see the disciples doing wonderful things. We see them casting out devils and healing the sick. But can I tell you something? They were living on the edge. They were, they were taking risks. Their lives were at risk. We want to experience all this miraculous stuff, amen? We want to experience the Holy Spirit and the power of God in the safety of our buildings. In the safety of our nice lives. Oh God, do it here. Do it in this room. Can I tell you something? God is not really all that interested to doing it in this room. He wants to do it out there. And if you want to experience the power of the Holy Spirit, and you want to experience the life of God and the power of God, then you and I have to go out there, not just huddle in here. Amen? And that's what I see, that's what I see in the New Testament. <clears throat> see, well, I, I want to experience God's power. I remember as a young Christian, uh, reading my Bible and beginning to discover for myself that the Holy Spirit was actually available to us. And, I, and if you were here last night, I kind of shared a little bit of my testimony, and I realize that some of you are here tonight that weren't here last night. But I shared a little bit of my testimony. I was not raised in a Christian home. I didn't, I didn't become a Christian until I was 24 years of age. Uh, prior to that, I was an atheist. I believed, didn't believe there was a God. And so when I became a Christian, I mean, I had a steep learning curve to understand. I remember the first time I held a Bible in my hands. And, and, and I just looked at it and I thought, how am I ever going to understand this? And, uh, but it was amazing. So I just thought, well, I guess I might as well start reading it. And uh, it was amazing after one year how much God had done for me just reading the Bible. I was devouring the Bible. I couldn't stop reading the Bible. <clears throat> but as I began, and I was in a church that didn't believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. They believed that because we had the Bible, we didn't need the Holy Spirit anymore. That all the gifts of the Spirit had passed away 2,000 years ago. And that we had the scriptures and that's all we needed. And that God didn't do anything anymore. We just kind of had, we got saved and we kind of hang on until Jesus comes. Or we get to go with Him. But nothing would happen in between. You just had to make sure you hung on and didn't let go of your salvation. But don't expect God to do anything. That was basically the attitude of the church. Well, as a new Christian, what did I know? So I thought, well, I guess that's the way it is until, but as I started reading my Bible... I thought, you know what? That's not what it says in here. It says that I can experience the power of God. So I began to hunger and thirst and pray and say, Lord, I want the power. I want to experience your power. I want to experience your Holy Spirit. Why can't I experience what the disciples experienced in the book of Acts? And so one day, uh, I was on a Saturday afternoon, and my, uh, my wife was downtown shopping, and I was looking after our two small children. And so I was, I was kind of praying. I was in my, just sitting in my living room praying. And I had my Bible open to Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. And I shared this scripture with you last night. Where it says, He chose you before the foundation of the world. And when I read that, it just hit me. Whoa! God chose me before He even made the earth or made the universe or made anything else. He already knew who I was and He chose me. And then as I began to meditate on that verse and pray over it, I, I realized, I said, well, if that's true then you obviously have a plan for my life. And I, 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 just, I just thought, I, I've got to have your plan, God. I've got to live the life that you chose for me. And so I didn't know how to do that. So I got on my knees, I started praying. And I said, Lord, if you, I'm, just, I'm, gonna, I'm asking you that I want to go through my life and I want to live the life that you planned out for me. I don't want to come to the end of my life and realize I just lived my own life, but I didn't live the life ordained for me by God. And so I said to the Lord, Lord, I don't trust me. If you leave it in my hands, I will mess it up. I will mess my life up. I don't trust me. So Lord, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to trust you. And Lord, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you this. Lord, do whatever you have to do in my life to cause me to live the life that, I was, that you want me to live. Lord, I'm trusting you. I'm not trusting this guy. And so, so then as I prayed, I felt, I, 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 I kind of, I made this promise, I made this commitment to the Lord. I said, I'll tell you what, Lord, I'm trusting you to sovereignly move in my life. Now, this time, I'm a high school teacher. I'm not thinking about ministry. I'm not thinking about planting churches or anything like that. 
I, I, don't even, I don't even desire ministry. I just desire God. I just desire His presence. I just desire His power. I want to experience God. I want to experience Him. I don't want to just read about Him, whether it be in the Bible or in another book. I want to experience Him. And so I, I, I said this to the Lord. I said, Lord, I'll tell you what, I'll make a deal with you. The deal is this. You do whatever you have to do to cause me to live the life that you've got planned for me. And my, that's your deal. That's your part of the bargain. I'm trusting in you to do that. And here's what I'll do. I said, Lord, I'll take every opportunity to serve you. I will never say no to you because I'm afraid. And I'll never say no to you because I've never done it before. If the opportunity presents itself to serve you, I will always say yes. I will not try to force open any doors. I'll not try to make anything happen. But I will step through every door that you open. But I won't try to make doors open. I'm just going to get up every day. I'm going to trust you, but I will never say no to you because of fear. And I will never say no to you because I've never done it before. Well, then I, after I finished praying, I got up. I was pretty satisfied with myself. And so uh, three days went by. And uh, three days later, my phone rang. And uh, when I answered the phone, it was a pastor. It wasn't my pastor. It was another pastor in our, in our community. And uh, he introduced himself. I'd never met him. And he said, are you Dave Wells? I said, yes. He says, well, we've been talking about you at our local ministerial meeting. And I was shocked at that. I said, you were? And he says, yes. And he says, we would like you to start a youth ministry among all the evangelical churches in our, in our whole community. Because you're a high school teacher, and all these kids go to the high school, and you, know, and you have access to them. And we want you to start this youth group that spans all the various churches. Well, you have to understand that I'm a new Christian. I have never led anything before. Nothing. I've never led a Bible study. I've never led anything. I've only just gone to church and sat in church. And so, as soon as he said that, I was paralyzed with fear. And I, and I was going to say, absolutely not. And just as I was going to speak and say no, the Holy Spirit showed up and said, what did you say to me three days ago? And here's what I said. This all happened within a, a couple of seconds. I said, oh my God, he heard that prayer. <laughs> and I realized right there that God was taking me up on what I had committed three days ago. And I also realized if I said no, then I didn't really mean what I said three days ago. So I felt like I was backed into a corner. And the Lord said, what are you going to do? I thought, I have no choice. So I said, I heard myself saying, yeah, okay, I'll do it. But I was petrified. I didn't, have a, I didn't have any idea about how I would do it. I didn't know what to do. And I, was in, and I wrestled with it for several days. I thought, what am I going to do? How am I going to do this? I don't, I've never led young people before. I have no training. I have no ministry training. How am I going to do this? And finally one day the Lord said to me, Dave, why don't you just be yourself? Why don't you just trust me and just be who you are, and I'll look after all the rest? Well, I said yes to that. Well, then what happened a few days later... The, the, the chairman of the school board came to visit me. And he was also the mayor of our city. He's a very powerful man politically. He came to me privately and he said, I'll tell you what, Dave, I understand you're going to lead this youth ministry. You're going to create this youth ministry in our community. He said, I want to tell you something that you have a free hand in the high school. You can do whatever you want. I'm going to talk to your principal, who was not a Christian, and tell him to leave you alone and to give you a free hand. You can use all the resources of the school. You can do anything you want. And I will back you. I will stand behind you. See, already the Holy Spirit is beginning to move. So then I said, okay. So I started a prayer meeting in my classroom. Three days a week, I'd have 70 to 100 kids in my classroom praying, calling on God at noon hours. Then I started training them how to share their faith. And I would put tracts in their hands. And they were going up and down the hallway sharing Jesus Christ with the other students. Nobody's tried to stop me. Then on the weekends, I would take over the school cafeteria and the gymnasium. And I would bring in contemporary singing groups. And I'd bring in special speakers. And I, and I had a coffee house where it was free coffee. And all the young people in the community started packing that place out. So on the weekends, the whole school was filled with unchurched people. And I, was, and I had trained the mind disciples to share Christ with them and we were preaching the gospel and sharing and I had a revival that went on for three years. Now can I tell you something? I didn't do that. That was the power because I had a bad reputation. 
So in desperation, they came to me and said, Hey, Dave, you teach school. You can speak. You preach. I had never preached. So I said, Yes, I'll preach. Okay. And so I preached there for four years. I, God punished them for four years. They had to listen to me learn how to preach. Amen. And so they couldn't get one. Um, and so one day in that, in that, in that four-year period, for a brief time, they did something unheard of. They got an, a Pentecostal preacher to be their interim pastor for six months. That was highly unusual for a church like that to have a Pentecostal come into their pulpit because they didn't believe in the gifts of the Spirit or anything. The very first night he came and preached, my wife and I looked at one another and we thought, whoa, there's something about that guy that's different than anybody we've ever heard. So we invited him to our house on a Sunday night. And every Sunday night we'd invite him to our house. And we started asking him questions about how the gifts of the Spirit work. And he began to disciple me. Well, one night he phoned me up and he said, hey, Dave, there's a person in our congregation who's dying of heart disease. And I want to go and pray for them. And he said, I want you to come with me. So I said, sure, because I'm thinking... Great, I'm finally going to see somebody pray for the sick. And so I went with him. And I was really, but man, this is going to be great. He's going to pray for the sick. I, I can finally see how this, how this is done. So we get in the house and, you know, you have a little bit of, the woman was laying on in bed. She couldn't get out of bed. Her heart was so bad she was bedridden. She was about 51 years old. And, uh, and so we have, you know, the tea and the cookies, and you kind of eat cookies and tea, and then finally the time came to pray for this woman. Well, then to my shock, this pastor turns to me and said, Dave, I want you to pray for this woman. I was petrified. I didn't know what to do. I thought, I've never seen anybody ever pray for. How do you pray for somebody to be healed? I didn't want to do it. I was, at, I said, this, and, and, and so I, I did, but I had made my promise, Lord. I'll never say no to you because of fear or because I've never done it before. So I said, okay, I'll do it. So I didn't know, I have any idea. So I'm walking across the room and as I'm walking across the room to pray for this woman, every kind of thought of doubt is bombarding my mind. Dave, you're, you're going to, this is stupid. You're not going to know what to do. You don't know how to pray for the sick. You don't have any faith to believe that she's going to be healed. And as I'm, as I'm walking across the room, my, my head is bombarded with all kinds of thoughts. She's not going to get healed. She's going to die. You're going to look like an idiot. You know, this woman's going to die because you don't have any faith. You don't, have, you don't expect this woman to be healed. All these thoughts are bombarding my mind. I went over to her. I mumbled some kind of prayer. And she was instantly healed. Boom. Oh. You know, that woman phoned me a couple of months ago. I hadn't heard from her in years. She phoned me about two months ago. She's in her 90s now. She's in her 90s. She's still doing great. She just phoned me up. We talked for a little while. That was 40 years ago, church. She's got other problems, but she, does, she still doesn't have any heart problems. Amen? Maybe she'll live till Jesus comes. I don't know. Amen? Now, who, what was that? Was that me? Was that my spirituality? No. That was the power of the Holy Spirit. Did I feel His power? No. I felt fear. I was terrified. Did I feel faith? No. I was filled with doubt and unbelief. But you know what? All I had to do was be obedient and go and pray some kind of prayer. And God said, that's enough. I can do that. That's all I need. Amen? It's not your fancy prayers. It's not you. You know what? You can't heal anybody. Amen. I can't heal anybody. I can't take credit for that woman being healed. My prayer was lousy. I was filled with unbelief. Amen? It wasn't me. I didn't heal her. Jesus Christ healed her. But I got to experience God's power because I determined that I would never say no because I was afraid or because I hadn't done it before. You see, many Christians do not experience the power of God because they will not go and stand on the edge. They will not take any risk. They will not get out of their comfort zone. Amen. We cannot experience God's power in the four walls of this room. We have to get out of here. There's a whole world out there that's dying and going to hell. There are nations like the nation of India where the majority of the people are, are lost. And we have the answer. We have the message. We have the power of God. Amen? If we don't do it, there is nobody else. The only question that you have to answer is, are you personally going to get involved or not? You don't have to, but then life will pass you by. 
It will pass you by. And you could have been experiencing it. You know, there, you know, you've heard this. You know, Jesus promised us he'd be with us always. Is that true? Yes. Jesus said, I'll be with you always. How many of you believe that? Yes. You believe that? Well, let's read the verse of in the scripture where he actually said that. It's in Matthew 28, in verse 18. Yes. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Yes. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. What's the context in which he says, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age? Go and make disciples. When you're going and making disciples, Jesus is with you. Amen. When we're hiding in our churches, in our comfort zone, he's out there. Amen? He's out there. We have the idea, well, you know, if we can just get a hot worship team, and we can just get the, you know, that we're almost there, I can almost feel God's presence. If this guy would just sing two more songs, man, we'd be right there. And the hair in the back of my head would stand up on end, and the hair in my arms would stand up, and say, ooh, I feel the presence of God. Is that what this is about? Can I tell you, it's not what it's about. It's about going out there, and preaching the gospel, and praying for the sick, and casting out devils and taking risks and standing on the edge and being half frightened out of your mind. Say, I want to I wanna, I wanna experience God's power. I'll tell you what you have to do. Put yourself in scary situations. Put yourself, say, how do I experience it? Put yourself in situations that scare the daylights out of you. That's where the Holy Spirit is. That's when you're really alive. You know, a few years ago, when I first started going to Vietnam, Vietnam is a communist country. The church is an underground church. It's persecuted. In the 90s, the persecution was terrible. The first time I went to Vietnam, the persecution was terrible. I had to go in disguises to go and preach. The church was meeting. Every, every, every day, the church would meet in a different location. One day, we'd be in the attic of a house. The next day, we'd be meeting in a motorcycle repair shop. One time, I was meeting in a Catholic monastery. The meeting was always shifting. Well, the authorities knew that we were having these church meetings, and they were raiding the places two hours behind us. I would leave, and two hours later, the authorities would show up and raid the place where we just were. Can I tell you something? I was scared. I was frightened. And, and there were times I'd lay in my bed at night in my hotel room, knowing that the next morning I'm going to have to do it again. Because what would happen is, is I would go to, and I was staying in a hotel in a part of the Ho Chi Minh City where business people would stay. People like me. And so I would, I would leave the hotel kind of dressed like this, casual business. I get into, a car would be sent for me, I get into the back seat of a car. In the back seat of a car, there would be a motorcycle helmet and a pollution mask to put over my face. And I'd have to make sure I wear a long sleeve shirt or a jacket to cover my white hairy arms. And then we would be in the back of the car, I'd have no idea where the meeting was. But somewhere along the line, there was going to be a motorcycle. And then all of a sudden, the car would pull over. I'd jump out of the back seat of the car with my motorcycle helmet on, my mask on. I'd jump in the back of this motorcycle, having no idea where we were going and the way we would go through the city. They would drive that motorcycle right into the building, right into the house, before they'd let me get off and take off my helmet. Then I'd preach for about eight hours, stand, straight, preaching. Then at the end, they would then leave in ones and twos and threes, and then I would leave last. Sometimes they would leave me in that house until it got dark and come and get me after dark. Then I would put all the motorcycle gear back on, jump in the back of the motorcycle, away we would go through the city. Somewhere along the line was going to be that car waiting for me. Then I'd see the car on the side of the road, the, the motorcycle would pull over, and I'd run for the back seat of the car, take off the gear, and then when I got to the hotel, I'd step out just like this. That was the way we did it. One day... I was running across the road for that car, and I started yelling and jumping and leaping in the street because I felt so alive. And I started saying, yelling, I'm alive! I'm alive! I had such, an, such a rush because I was on the edge. I had to battle my fear. Sometimes I'd lay in bed at night, and I'd become afraid, and I'd start shaking in my bed. But I have to push through my fear. But can I tell you something? I was alive. I was living on the edge. I was experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit and those meetings. Amen? Now, you don't have to do something that dramatic. But I want to tell you something. 
that God wants to use every one of you. Amen. He, the Holy Spirit is for all of us. Amen? Amen? He wants to use every one of you. And He has an incredible plan for your life. But unless you're willing to get out of your comfort zone and stand on the edge, life will pass you by. Yes, you can live out your own plan for your own life. But there's another life. A life ordained by the Holy Spirit that is incredibly exciting that God has for you. And if you come to the, you know, at the, if you come to the end of your life, and you realize that you've just lived a comfortable life, you will regret that. I want to come to the end of my life and say, wow, what a ride. Amen? Amen. Amen. Wow, was that exciting. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna, now I'm going to step into eternity and the best is yet to come. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's the way I want to live. <clears throat> you know, there's a scripture that I used to read and I used to wonder about. It's in 2 Samuel chapter 23. And I wondered for years, why is this even in the Bible? 2 Samuel 23, looking at verse 20 and 21. And it says, Then Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabziel, who had done mighty deeds, killed the two sons of Ariel of Moab. He also went down and killed a lion in the middle of a pit on a snowy day. He killed an Egyptian, an impressive man. Now the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, but he went down to him with a club and snatched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. Now why would the Bible say, talk about this guy going down into a pit on a snowy day to kill a lion? You know what, if I saw a lion in a pit, would I say, you know, I think I'll just climb down there and kill that baby. I think I'll just go down there and kill that lion. How many would, how many think that, that would be the first thought in your head? My thought would be, I'm getting out of here as fast as I can go. I'm not confronting any lion. But he went down into the pit and took on that lion and killed that lion. And then he meets an Egyptian, a powerful warrior, who has a spear. And he's only got a club. But he, that doesn't stop him. He goes up to this Egyptian, snatches the spear out of his hand, and kills this Egyptian with his own spear. Why is that in there? Why is that in the Bible? For years I'd read that and say, well, God, that's pretty exciting, but why is that there? You know, it's always good to read Scripture in context, isn't it? Because then you read the next verse. And it says, these things, in verse 22, these things Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, did. And he had a name as well as the three mighty men. He was honored among the thirty, but he did not attain to the three. And David appointed him over his guard. Can I tell you something? What it says is this. It meant promotion for him. You see, many times we meet lions on snowy days. Not, not down here in Dallas you don't, but I, can I tell you something? We have many snowy days where I come from. We don't have lions, but we have bears. Close. <clears throat> but this meant promotion for him. He became appointed to David's bodyguard. If you read on a bit further about Benaiah, eventually he led the whole army of Israel. He became the second most powerful man in the whole kingdom, eventually. How did he get there? I'll tell you why. It was his whole approach to life. Benaiah, when he faced an obstacle, he didn't see it as an obstacle. He saw it as an opportunity. He said, you know, most of us would be afraid of a lion and certainly would not climb down into a pit to confront a lion, but he did. Why? What it's telling us about this man is he confronted uh, the obstacles of life. As things came to him, he believed this. He believed that God was ordering his steps. And wherever his steps led him, he would confront in faith and in the power of the Holy Spirit every situation he encountered. It didn't matter how frightening it was. It didn't matter how more, much more powerful it was than him. He had such a deep faith in his God and he had made up his mind that he would confront every situation and that every situation was not a stumbling stone but was actually a stepping stone to a better future. That's the way he approached his life. So when he met a lion, I'm going to kill that lion. When he met an Egyptian, I'm going to kill that Egyptian. It didn't matter whether he was 
handicapped through lack of weapons or whether he was facing a foe more powerful than him, he believed in the power of his God to be upon him. Can I tell you something, church? That is exactly the way that God wants you and I to approach life. Amen? That we are not to be intimidated by anything. But in the power of the Holy Spirit, we are to confront the issues of our life and look at them as opportunities rather than as obstacles. If I approach my life that way, then God works for me and God works with me. And I've experienced that many, many times. You see, what you do with the challenges you encounter determines your destiny and it determines your future. It's in your hands. <clears throat> the Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. you believe that? Amen. Do you believe that? Many Christians actually don't believe that. Oh, they can, they, can, they can quote the scripture, but they don't believe it. Because when they reach an obstacle, they whine, they cry, and they quit. But I believe the Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Do you believe that or not? I personally believe that. I believe that. I don't believe I'm here by coincidence. I don't believe I'm here by accident. I believe I'm here in the divine providence of God, actually. Now, did I invite myself to come here? No, I would never do that. I came by invitation. When PB, when PB asked me, David, would you come on this date? He said, sure. The answer is yes. Because for me, the answer is always yes. The other day, uh, it was yesterday, Sam approached me and said, hey, David, would you, tomorrow, would you speak to the youth? Now, that wasn't on my schedule. I'm only supposed to speak to you three times. But he said, will you speak to the youth? Did I hesitate? I did not hesitate. The answer is yes. Of course I'll do that. If you said, well, Dave, would you come on and pray for me? Absolutely. Of course I will do that. The answer is yes. What's the question? Amen? I settled that a long time ago. I'm still living off of that prayer that I prayed when I was in my mid-20s. I'm still living off that prayer. That prayer has led me to this day. I would never, when I prayed that prayer, if you would have told me that I would pastor a church one day, I never would have believed that. If you would have told me I'd be a church planner for 10 years, that I'd end up leading a network of churches around the world, that I'd be traveling all over the world preaching the gospel, I would have thought, I would never have imagined that in a million years. It has led me, that prayer has led me further and to places that I never, ever imagined that I would go. Amen? I'm still living off that prayer. Hallelujah. So when somebody says, Dave, will you go to, I'm going to Spain in February. I've never been to Spain. Why are you going to Spain? Because somebody wants me to go to Spain. I'm going to Spain. Amen. Amen. The answer is yes. What's the question? And I've learned that when I do that, I experience God's power. I experience His Holy Spirit. I experience His grace. And it's exciting. Amen. After I prayed that prayer, I said to my wife, she came home from shopping that day. I said, you know, I prayed this prayer. And I said, I said to Linda, my wife's name was Linda, I said to Linda, yeah, I'll tell you what, you stick with me and you'll live an exciting life. That's what I said to her. And so every once in a while, I've been married now for 45 years. Every once in a while, I'll say to my wife, you stick with me and you'll live an exciting life. Well, a few years ago, uh, we were in the Philippines and we were preaching there. And uh, we were going from one island to another in an outrigger canoe. And uh, my time's gone, so I'll finish the story, I'm done. But we were in an outrigger canoe, and a big storm came up. We didn't have any life jackets. The, the canoe had too many people in it. In fact, it wasn't even enough room for me to be even in the canoe. I was actually on a board hanging onto a, onto a small mast. This huge waves. It was, there were waves 20 feet high. They were breaking over the boat. We were sinking. Uh, I was actually angry that we were out there, because we weren't even supposed to be out there. And we had no life jackets. We had little kids in the boat, and we were not going to make it. And the motor kept stalling all the time. And so water, we're drenched, water's pouring in. We got these little cups, we're bailing, trying to keep the boat from sinking. There are sharks swimming in the water. And my wife is kind of sitting in front of me. And finally she turns around and she looks at me and she says, you know what, Dave? She said in a really calm voice, she said, you know what, Dave? This time it's a little too exciting. <laughs> <laughs> and then we both started laughing, actually. We both started laughing. What were we else were we going to do? Well, obviously, we didn't drown. We made it. I'm here. Amen? Um, but we've had many, many, many exciting times in God. And you know what? It's not over yet. But listen to me. And I'm going to close with this. 
I'm nothing special. I'm just an ordinary person who said yes. I'm just an ordinary person who said, I want to experience the